morning, everyone. Um, I hope we're all okay. I'm Yoss. I'm, I'm from the design team here at Jupiter Play, and I'm hosting today's call, uh, webinar, should I say. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we found that people have some issues with the webinars before, so uh, browser-wise, we find Chrome and Microsoft Edge to work the best. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. We'd love to hear where you're calling from today. Um, yeah, tell us where you're from, what industry you're in, um, what you're what you're kind of interested in. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the, the webinar, and um, yeah, it'd be great to get some engagement on there. Um, so the topic today is uh, talking through the environments for the future, creating active communities, and really exploring how big picture thinking can. Um, accommodate for all in society. So it's a really, really interesting webinar that um, Sam and Rosie are going to talk to you about. Um, so I think, I think we're going to, I'll hand it over to them. They can introduce themselves and yeah. That's brilliant. Adio. Thank you, Yossi. Yeah, it's great to have you uh, join us this morning. And yeah, looking forward to, to, to today's session in, uh, in particular. Uh, good to see that we've got a, a fair amount registered as well. I think we're looking at sort of 50 today, aren't we, uh, Rosie, with quite a few people live as we speak. Yeah, we've got a good uh, good sign up. So looking forward to discussing this with you. Perfect. Brilliant. So yeah, let's do a, a couple of instructions. I'll, uh, as always, let ladies go first. Rosie, if you want to yeah, tell us uh, a bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rosie. I'm the creative lead at Jupiter Play. I have been with the company for about seven years now. So I joined straight out of university um, and I haven't left. Um, I really enjoy working here. Um, my job has been so kind of varied. I started in the design team, working on lots of amazing projects, specialised in bespoke design, which was really interesting. Um, and now I've kind of taken a step out of the design team and I'm looking at some of our really key projects, pushing us into new areas um, and, yeah, coming up with really new ideas and making sure that we're kind of leading in this space um, and working on things that we really care about. Brilliant. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, I think... Yeah, you're so right in, in the way that, yeah, we're looking to push the industry forward, uh, wanting to, you know, I think do these webinars not only to, I think, give our insight and our knowledge, but also to, to I think, take on feedback. Um, yeah, see from not only our perspective, but everyone else in the industry's perspective on how they take on these topics. And, you know, I think these presentations, are, I always like to say, are, are very, you know, malleable. Um, we like to take on insight and information from the various industries to make it the best it can be. So we love to, to see that sort of chat section going uh, and yeah, really get insight uh, throughout. I can see a couple of uh, familiar faces. Chris, uh, Raven, it's uh, great to see you this morning and, and Craig as well. I know that you've uh, joined for, for quite a few of our webinar series. So brilliant to have you have you back again. And yeah, um, as I say, just yeah, pop your, your name um, and where you're tuning in from uh, in the chat. It'd be great to hear where you're from. So in terms of, of myself, uh, so my name's Sam. I'm the regional sales manager here at Jupiter. Uh, similar to Rosie, um, I joined straight out of the university as well. I uh, haven't been uh, with Jupiter for as long as Rosie, but it's creeping up uh, that way. Um, so I started off working uh, in the north particularly, so in business development, looking at how we can really push and, and accelerate our Yelp uh, range uh, in Jupiter, and then moved into more of a sales role, so covering sort of Blackpool down to Coventry and uh, have recently made a move down to the capital, so currently cover London and the sort of surrounding areas, which has been really exciting, different, and yeah, uh, I think certainly one that has has been uh, a really nice change of scenery uh, from my perspective. So before we get into to the sort of real the the presentation itself, we always like to give you a bit of background because we know that there could be a range of people um, tuning in today that they've never heard of Jupiter, never seen us before, so. We always like to start off with, yeah, understanding who we are as a company. So we're a family run business. Um, our MD, Michael, uh, and his wife, uh, Catherine, uh, are the two directors here at Jupiter. And yeah, they've, they've been in the business since 1999 when we found it. Throughout our whole history, we've always been innovators. Um, we've always looked to push the industry in a way that it actually changed the way that we think um, and actually design and deliver play areas um, through 
crafted, independent uh, and passionate team that's, yeah, we've won a couple of awards and yeah, I think our designs uh, really do always push the boundaries. And I think the projects that we go for at Jupiter are always the ones that we want to have that real wow factor um, and yeah, challenge the norms of the industry as well. From our values perspective, these are the five, um, the five key values that we hold uh, true to, to every sort of process that we go through when designing a player, you know, starting off with that creativity, daring to be different and, and looking at a project from a different angle. Building up trust um, with our with our clients is always key to, I think, have those those open and welcoming relationships where, you know, we're more than happy for to push back and, you know, challenge the sort of thought process um, you may be going through. Um, and we're always committed to doing um, everything that it takes um, to actually deliver uh, projects with, with true uh, passion and commitment. And then finally as well, um, quality. Quality is the key. Uh, and this re, uh, sort of leads really nicely um, into our Global Partners Programme. Um, we work with a range of suppliers uh, from around Europe. Um, and this is how I think we started off as being true innovators within the industry. Uh, we're not actually attached to a single brand. Um, in 1999, when we first started, we were we were the first play company that wasn't directly linked to one singular brand um, in the industry. So you may be wondering sort of what, what did this lead to? Um, it actually led to us being extremely adaptable, um, you know, blending the different brands that we work with to create truly incredible spaces, you know, not shoehorning products into spaces because we haven't got the catalog or the width or breadth uh, of products um, that need to actually fit into these spaces. So yeah, working with all these these brands is, is really, has been really brilliant. Uh, you know, some uh, for a fairly long time uh, and some fairly new as well. And just on that sort of vein of being innovators and I think disruptors, we really want to challenge, I think the traditional way in which play is actually procured and installed uh, within the industry. Uh, we would always push the question with the traditional tender process is it something that gets the best value for the end user, um, the community at the end of the day? So, so how can we actually, you know, look at that, that process in a different way and make sure that we're delivering uh, for the highest quality? We work in a, in a true range uh, of ways, so whether that be mostly with landscape architects through that specification process, working in that collaborative manner to really help and assist in picking out the right product for uh, a design. We can also do design and build. So, um yeah working on the full design itself getting us in as part of the team to really deliver uh, and take you through the whole journey but i think with with both of those topics collaboration is the true key um once again going back to having those open conversations using our expertise and knowledge of play but then also drawing from your expertise whether that be through landscape through uh, local authority where you know you have more your you have your ear to the ground with the community um, and yeah, really drawing in on their sort of wants and needs to ensure that we we are delivering a space that is built for and catering for the community that it sits in, not just uh, yeah, a, a copy and paste design that you know, has worked previously. So yeah, the collaboration is, is always key. So having a look at today's topic. So throughout this series, we've been looking at really environments for the future. How can we future proof our green and open spaces to ensure that they are going to last the test of time, um, not only through quality, but also through design as well. So throughout this um, presentation, these are the three topics that we're going to be looking at. So currently the state of physical activity within the UK, how do we shape up and how do we fare? What issues do we need to address? So how and why are we sort of looking at this topic in particular? Um, and then finally, having a look at the key design principles to adopt when creating active communities. How can we really yeah, ensure that each design that we, we have a look at, we are involved with, is, is really creating those active communities in particular. So what's the vision uh, for today uh, and for our sort of want moving forward? We really want a, a space that can reflect those community needs uh, and not just focus on sport, but having a look at the activity levels um, of the full width and breadth of each community. Because I think, especially when you get to that sort of teenage age range, and I'll touch on it um, a bit more in detail later on, it is a case of, I think we're sort of forced down that sort of traditional sport route 
or it's very much you know you're left to your own devices so how can we actually look at our communities look at the way in which we design spaces to ensure that yeah all activity levels can be reached and met through a variety of different ways um, and some more discreet than others um, and yeah we've got um, a real host of ideas that we want to put forward to you uh, and really showcase how we can create these active communities and I think that there's always the the question of why why are we why are we doing this why are we covering this topic and I think in particular for activity levels within the UK there are a whole host of reasons why uh, and I think this list covers the majority but there is still some uh, that are left off you know we've got combination of childhood obesity in the UK, uh, that teenage uh, physical activity uh, really dropping off um, at that sort of 15, 16 year old um, gap, in particular girls and, and why they drop out uh, of sport uh, at such early ages. Then combined with, I think, some, some real world issues, you know, that cost of living crisis um, in particular, I always think, okay, what would be the first thing to go off the, the sort of monthly outgoings uh, from my perspective? And I think a gym membership would be one of the first to be sort of chalked off. So how can we ensure that our public realm spaces actually cater for this? You know, you've also got the sort of the hangover of COVID um, and yeah, um, the aging population that we have. So we're hoping to sort of cover and touch on all of these topics throughout the presentation in a very holistic view on why we want to create these active communities. So let's start by what we need. What are our needs throughout our life? Uh, and how much physical activity do we need um, throughout the generation? So we start off um, with, you know, being a toddler, you need around um, 180 minutes uh, of uh, physical activity per day. Uh, and this is sort of looking at, you know, reaching, grasping, um, starting to walk uh, in that way. Then moving up through the age ranges um, at that sort of junior and teenage age range, we need that drops down to around about an hour's worth of physical activity per day. A lot of our schools are actually really catering for uh, and pushing that uh, minimum 60 minute activity uh, per day. But I think outside of the school environment, um, the built environment, there isn't really that push and that want. And I think in order to create these active communities, we need the range and, and variety of stakeholders that are influencing our younger generation to actually come together to be able to provide these facilities in particular. Yeah, then moving up into sort of the teenage age range, uh, just going back to what I mentioned around being left to your own devices. This is where I think you see that true drop off um, in particular when it comes to that uh, organized sport. If, if you're not competent and confident enough, yeah, there really does seem to be that drop off um, in actual physical activity. Uh, and this continues when we're sort of an adult um, and during that elderly sort of phase, you know, you, you still need that half an hour's extra exercise per day. Uh, but what what actual sort of pieces uh, do we have available for these two um, age ranges? Uh, I would argue not a lot. So how can we can we really cater for that in the public realm? And, and this diagram in particular, I think is, is brilliant because in order to create active communities, we need a very sort of cyclical um, route around it. You know, we, we need to have an older generation that is, is showing the younger generation, okay, this is how you can be physically active and, and bringing them up in a way that actually showcases and sort of creates real leaders um, in the communities where they want to be like their, their parents, their grandparents, their caregivers. So just splitting down this diagram in particular, in order to create the, the full and continuous active communities, we need to have a focus um, on the right hand side. So those three demographics on the right to inspire the younger ones to then have that knock on effect and, and continue throughout those active generations. So looking back um, at, I think, COVID, because although it does feel like <laughs> 100 years ago, uh, it, it is still really prominent uh, and is having knock-on effects um, in our society today. And UNICEF anticipated that the pandemic would really impact our children's health uh, and behaviours moving forward. And I think this is so true. I was at a school in Islington last week. And um, if we think about the generations which are now entering our sort of school age, you know, that four, five year, five year olds. These, this is the generation that's actually was brought up in COVID. You know, they had that hour of physical activity per per day. And and speaking to the head teacher at the school in Islington, she was she was talking about the fact that the real drop off in which they've noticed of the competency of the children um, in that reception in year one. And in comparison to pre COVID, there's such a big gap. So how can we sort of plug that and fill that um, by the way in which we design our spaces? 
And yeah, um, during that sort of time period um, and throughout COVID, the activity level did truly get worse. Um, I think sort of pre-COVID, we had sort of, I think, around not even two thirds, or not even a third uh, of our children sort of actually reaching that hour uh, of physical activity per day. And of course, during that sort of COVID time period, when we were all locked inside and we only had that hour of being able to go outside and, and be physically active in an open space, it, it really led to a, lot, a high drop off. And I think in particular in the sort of communities where they may be not as affluent, they may, be not, they may not have that sort of green space that, that quite a few of, of our children are fortunate to, where were they able to get that physical activity from? Where were they able to actually, yeah, sort of develop and grow uh, and have that um, sort of yeah, real activity within their lifestyle? And, you know, knocking on and following on from COVID, it is a case of we are getting better, we are getting back. You know, it's been a couple of years since we sort of came out of, of lockdowns. And yeah, we've, we've sort of pushed back up to that level to which we were at pre-COVID. But, you know, you would argue that even before COVID, it, it still wasn't good enough. Um, before that pandemic, um, I think around, uh, I think it was sort of like 29% uh, of our, our children weren't even getting 30 minutes of that physical activity per day. And this drop off is is really key. And I think although we have, yes, got back up to where we were pre-COVID, it still has a lot of you know rectifying to do. We need to really push on our children and make sure that they break out of what they, they were before uh, and yeah, ha have that sort of hour that they need of physical activity uh, per day. And as we move through the generations as well, we have a look at our teenage uh, physical activity with one in five young people, uh, actually, when they come to the age of 17, uh, are classed as obese, uh, and a further of one in seven are actually classed um, as overweight. And just touching on what I mentioned earlier, you know, this is the, the sort of age range where, you know, you come out of school, uh, you're not sort of, I say, forced to do PE um, every week or every day, you're not sort of yeah, uh, confined to actually um, have this physical activity and have it put on yourself. And you're very much left to your own devices. And this is where I think those who are you know, physically active before that, you know, they're involved in the sports teams, for example, football, cricket, swimming, whatever uh, they may do. This is where they sort of push on and continue that lifestyle. But for that large demographic that don't really have that sort of constant physical activity pre a sort of teenage age, this is where that drop off comes. It, it really does just take a plummet off off that um, the, the sort of amount of time they're, they're being physically active. So how can we actually cater for, for this very hard to reach demographic as well? I mean, in the comments, it'd be really interesting to hear, uh, particularly from our local authority sort of listeners, how you cater for that sort of teenage age range, because from speaking to a lot of my clients, you know, it is such a tough demographic to hit um, when focusing on um, play and in particular getting them active. And then just taking a bit more of a, a look in on that demographic as well, uh, we focus on on girls um, in this in this sort of age range as well. You know, more than one million girls in the UK lose interest in sport as a teenager. And the recent uh, um, the recent study which came out, which was uh, from the Yorkshire Sport Foundation and Women in Sport, I think really opened the eyes of, of so many. And it's a great. Um, research paper if you haven't come across it we'd be more than happy to send it through and, and link it afterwards but it just gives that insight into how us the teenage girls truly feel about the way in which they are physically active um and you know 59 uh, percent of girls don't feel welcome in their parks and open spaces and if they don't even want to go into these sort of green areas and green spaces then how, how do we expect them to be you know physically active and and push themselves to to be physically active you know uh, and the parks and, and green spaces are, I think, that real area which which the the main sort of zone which they would actually be physically active outside of that formalised sport. So how can we make this a more welcoming area for for them to be comfortable uh, in that space? We then move into to the next generation, so our adults. Um, so. I think the data gap here is is really interesting um, and Rosie will touch on it a, a bit later in, in the data that we have uh, available and the fact that it is 
cent like really centric around men and we've got a lot of statistics on how uh, men are with physical activity but there is a real gap um in in women and um, how they sort of uh, interact with physical activity but the stats that we do have you know around one in three of men and one in two of women are not active enough to lead that good and healthy lifestyle uh, and we sort of raise the question of, of why is that you know is it sort of the working lifestyle and the working balance that allows it or is it that physical activity um and i think the cost to the uk is is really really so sort the of mind blowing, you know, uh, one in six deaths in the UK um, are actually due to that physical inactivity, uh, costing the UK around £7.4 billion annually. And it, I think that statistic is, is so worrying, you know, worrying. You know, if we can put in facilities and um, pieces that, that sort of stop this and allow our adults to be physically active alongside their children um, and, and everything like that, how can we truly, yeah, cater for and, and reduce this this worrying statistic of one in six deaths um being um yeah equated to physical activity and then we move into to our final generation as well the elderly and their physical activity levels i think with um, the way that our sort of population is going you know we have currently got a very aging population i think we're going to continue uh, to do so uh, over the years so once again, going back to the topic, we need to future-proof our environments for when this sort of imbalance, I think, becomes even heavier on, on the side of, of the elderly. And some of the stats that we've, we've got on screen are, are quite interesting, you know, and once again, worrying. When sort of that, that age range is between 65 and 74, they, there's only 29% um, of the population which are physically inactive. But when they move up into 85, that jumps to 70% of the population are physically inactive. And we want to ask the question, why? Why is there such a big difference between this age gap? And, and what are the needs of these different demographics, even within this elder, elderly community? And, and how can we actually design spaces that fit into this environment and fit into our built environment that can encourage them to be out, outside and, and physically active um, as well? Because when we look at what we currently provide in our in our parks and open space, and I think it is, and a lot of it is is very formalised. You know, it is sort of pieces and spaces that I think are only one dimensional in a way that they actually cater for um, our provision. It's you know, for example, tennis courts and running tracks. You can only really do one form of physical activity um, in these spaces, and. Is that what everyone wants to be doing? Um, you know, does everyone want to be playing tennis or running? Um, and how can we create environments that are very sort of user driven that actually, you know, we can sort of take our own vein off of uh, and actually, yeah, make our own and, and do our own different physical activities um, within. So how can this provision be sort of altered and changed and molded to really, yeah, allow people to, to do what they want uh, and um, yeah, be physically active in different ways. And yeah, I'll pass over to Rosie to, to take a look at how we can um, actually cater for and, and how we've been looking at it from a real holistic view uh, from the design perspective. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So um, I think what we've got on screen is um, a project that we, we've worked on previously and it was an amazing opportunity to be able to look at that bigger picture approach. Um, so this is um, a leisure centre that um, had quite a progressive idea to um, turn the surrounding space into um, the facility um, and extend on the facility, the leisure centre, um, to provide that like free um, option for people. Um, and it would it would kind of act as an introduction into being active, which would drive people to use the leisure centre in the future. Um, I think what we try to do here is um, provide facilities that catered for everyone. Um, so we really drilled down and looked at what everyone's needs would be um, and made sure that was represented throughout the space. Um, so we really think um, that having this master plan approach um, to a space where we consider everyone is um, the right strategy and the right approach to um, yeah, find a solution and design more successful spaces for everyone. 
So in this section, um, I'm going to cover some design principles. So if you followed our webinar series this year, um, you'll have noticed that we've been presenting design principles to address the topics in each of our webinars. Um, because we really want to give you real solutions to real problems. Some of our principles will overlap. Um, and this is because we're really passionate about the way we work. Um, and we know it's a formula that leads to really successful projects that actually make an impact on communities. Um, and we believe that if we adopt these principles, we will help to create spaces that generate healthier, more active communities. So I'm just going to go into a bit more depth of this list that you can see on the screen. So to start with, um, we think carrying out local assessments is really important. This is an example from a project that we worked on a while ago um, where we looked at the wider area. We picked out the play provision in the locality and we assessed what the community already had on their doorstep um, to ensure that we would be proposing something different um, and delivering the community something different from what they already have. Um, this this um, example shows that exercise from a play perspective, um, but we can adopt this in order to deliver the right active proposal for a community. If we look at the areas, active leisure sport facilities, we can ensure that we're filling in those gaps and addressing the real community needs so that we're definitely making a difference um, to these people's lives. And building on that, after, after doing that, we think consultation is key. Um, in order to gain a real insight from consultation events um, and to get a really broad impression of what the community wants and needs, we must reach out to a wider audience. So that's not just consulting um, with people that are already using the park. Um, we must we must kind of reach out and try and get people that maybe are a bit tentative um, involved and feel confident to voice their opinions, because that's how we'll we'll learn and we'll reach out um, and deliver solutions for everybody. I think we also need to acknowledge our privilege and our influence as professionals and not push our own opinion or our own agenda onto these key stakeholders. And we must have a real empathetic view and value difference. Um, we really need to understand specific issues in these specific communities. Um, and I think if we don't do that, there's no point in holding consultation events. And then another design principle would be ensuring that we are building um, these provisions into the landscape working with the the existing landscape so how can activity be built into our landscapes and can we work to create an environment a whole environment that promotes physical literacy so we'll look at these questions in a bit more detail and we really want to put an emphasis on activity not sport um formalized sport has had a big kind of um priority put onto it and there are a lot of facilities out there to do organised sport, it's activity that is lacking the provision. So um, we're just breaking these down and giving you some little, little ideas. Um, we can add the very fun, joyful experience of jumping, um, which everyone can do in very small, easy, cost effective ways. So whether that be a series of trampolines or just items to jump between a longer route, you're making that route more interesting um, and more active. Building climbing into the landscape requires a little more thinking and planning. Um, a standalone climbing system can be a challenging obstacle um, that people can come across on their, on, on their walk or their day out but it could be something more integrated, like um, a traversing wall built into the landscape. But as I say, something like that, it's more bespoke, it needs planning, it needs thinking about. I really love these ideas. This is one of my favorite pages. Um, you could address running in a really traditional manner with a running track. Sam, Sam highlighted that 
um, running tracks are a provision out there to be active. Um, but I think there are much more fun ideas um, like we have on this slide. Um, I I hate running, um, but maybe if if the, it was more fun, like in these images, I might might run a little bit more. Um, the image top left is actually a football pitch um, with a really undulating surface. And it really puts everyone on a level playing field. So it removes that competitive edge of sport. And it just makes it about having fun. And everyone just ends up running around and laughing together. Um, so it opens it up to a wider audience. And again, we could address um, throwing, catching and hitting in a traditional manner through sport with football, basketball, cricket. But we could also offer something else, something a bit more stimulating for a wider audience. So drums, they require hitting. You can catch a zip line seat. And with football, does that need to be a static pair of goalposts or can it be an interactive ball wall that has a range of games on it that change all the time, that are programmed to tell you your score? So I think it's giving people that choice. It's showing people different options. Um, so when we think back about consultation events, kids and people in the community don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to ask for. So we need to show them different options, more creative solutions um, to being active. And finally, walking or active travel, how can we make traveling from one space to another more appealing so we're less likely to jump in jump in a car um there's so many ways we can add interest to a route and make a journey more active for a rate a wider range of users i think if we just think a little bit harder this can be as simple as stepping stones and balancing beams um to something more challenging like a parkour route um yeah there's just so many different things we can do if we just step out of the box I think and think more creatively um, and yeah I think it's all about squeezing little ideas into small spaces and really make these spaces work really hard um, so we hope that's provided you with some interesting ideas um, I'm going to pass over to Sam again who is going to discuss how we can provide real solutions for communities Perfect. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, uh, I really like some of those examples. I think, in particular, the the wonky football pitch um, yeah, is a I'd real love leveler. To have a go on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it would definitely make me feel made me play better at football. So we will definitely have to take <laughs> a trip over to there. But yeah, I mean, just a, a question for for the audience as well. So, sort of which was which was your sort of favourite um, out of those those different uh, options that we put forward? What would you love to see um, in your local space? And I think. In particular for, for Woodford, uh, as you mentioned, taking that sort of holistic approach to all of the different spaces around that area. You know, I'd love to sort of pose the question, is it a case of, you know, uh, those those listening, do you do that? Do you, is it very much a case-by-case -case basis um, that I think we often see with local authorities in particular, or, or is there sort of that bird's eye view that we see spreading across, um, you know, a, a community and a, a sort of facility that, that ensures they have different sort of routes to go down and different options to play on. So it'd be great to, to see in the comments um, or in the chat box uh, what you guys think. So yeah, so moving on to to the solution um, that we can provide. So I think from from what Rosie was discussing, that's um, you know very much a, a sort of product focus and um, a built to landscape focus. But from the actual sort of research um, and the sort of thought process behind these designs, how can we really create these spaces um, that are, are truly, um, you know, activating our communities. And, and one way that we've chosen to go down the route on um, is actually getting involved with, with Coventry University to take a look in a bit more detail into the fundamental movement skills. Just to give you a bit of background on, on FMS uh, or the fundamental movement skills, they are a set of skills, um, I think it's around 12, that actually, if developed to a high level um, during our childhood, give us competence and confidence um, when going through life. And we'll, we'll take a look at what benefits that can have um, in a second. But from our perspective and from our involvement, we're actually on a project at the minute, which is collaborating with Bradley Murphy Design, Urban and Civic and Coventry University to sponsor a PhD student, uh, Amy, who is taking a look at how the impacts um, of the fundamental movement skills through play can actually help develop 
um, our children. And yeah, it's it's uh, a work in progress um, at the minute. Uh, hopefully this summer we'll be looking at actually getting um, you know some schools down to site. We'll be doing this at, at Holton Fields uh, in rugby. And yeah, getting some some of the kids down to site and actually understanding how they move around the space and and how they learn because the outcomes from from this study we just want to to really understand okay from a design process and a thought process uh, how can we actually look at a design to ensure that all of the skills within the fundamental movement skills uh, are actually catered for within an area but not only catered for but actually the challenges there as well because if it is sort of basic and low level it's not going to push our children to develop it's it's a very sort of yeah short ceiling uh, almost in the way that they'll develop a skill up to a point and then it'll be gone so how can we really uh, challenge our children uh, in these spaces as well so looking at the physical literacy uh, literacy uh, as i mentioned this is where um we actually yeah take that time uh, and and the children take their time to learn these skills to then be able to be competent and confident um, when moving up that age range and, and going into sort of teenage and adulthood, um, which then allows them to sort of carry on that physical activity and, and that lifestyle. I think a lot of the reasons, just going back to the formalized sport and, and that high teenage drop off in both generally and, and girls in particular, um, is because they don't have that, that confidence and competence within themselves to, to really be able to, to yeah, push on um, and yeah, get involved with these sports. You know, if they don't feel as though they're going to be up to the level um, that, you know, the other, their sort of peers are that are already involved with this, then they may not want to join uh, and carry on. So with the fundamental movement skills, it, it's not a case of it, it just happens. You know, we don't develop these skills naturally. Um, schools around the UK um, have this built into their curriculum. So they need to uh, develop four of the, the core uh, fundamentals uh, movement skills but we want to understand that in our built environment and in our green and open spaces how can we as designers help push this and, and give the opportunity for all of uh, our children to do so because if actually mastered um, and yeah if we have that real grounding and base level of skills at a young age it brings on such benefits you know within school there's a 40 percent um, increase in test scores from a, a lifetime perspective, there's actually increased annual earnings of seven to eight percent. There's obviously the health benefits, which are always associated with uh, active lifestyles, with that reduced risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. But I think one thing which we we looked at during COVID, in particular, and uh, in particular, I think not only our physical health but our mental health. Um, this actually, if these skills can be sort of developed and catered for, it actually sees and shows increases in self-esteem and happiness which is so key when we've been through such a tough time mentally uh, during that covid period so yeah if we can ensure these are all incorporated into our designs then it's always going to be uh, it's going to have these brilliant um, benefits for for our generations to come so you may be thinking okay what does an fms play area look like is it something that we've never seen before is it something that you know is is totally unique but it, it's not actually the case um this is a space that we designed um for a tender for warwick district council uh, unfortunately we weren't successful um with this one but i think you know looking at the, the real plethora of designs that we have um in our sort of system it is key that we sort of use these ones where we've where we've sort of inputted these ideas and the thought process to showcase um to everyone uh, but yeah, this was a, a design which was was fairly simple um, in its sort of nature. You know, it was more about the, the thought process of the equipment that's going to be going into it. Um, and yeah, making sure that, as I mentioned, that challenge is there to really push um, all the children that are sort of being involved um, in this space and going to it um, on a regular basis. So yeah, color coding the different skills that we have. So from that educational perspective, uh, the children, uh, the parents and the caregivers can understand what the thought process is behind putting in these different play pieces and yeah as I say building that challenge and and also whilst whilst doing so um you know creating a beautiful player that uh, is is really an eye-catching and and sort of draw to to the space and as I say unfortunately we weren't successful this was our first sort of outing with the FMS and understanding how we can use it but uh, as a first go uh, personally this may be a bit of a biased opinion but I think it was yeah a really good effort and just touching on that evidential basis, um, how can we actually showcase um, what physical activity our communities 
are undertaking and how many hours they have because as an industry and in particular in the play industry i think it's so difficult to track the amount of hours and the almost return on investment that we get from from our spaces and when we're investing you know 150 200 pounds into a play area what does that actually look like in terms of physical activity i think it's very tough to to, to, to sort of see but um, with the range that we've got, which is the Yelp uh, range, we have a set of five products that can all track um, the statistics and the playtime um, of the actual individual piece. So there's five different pieces that cater for all demographics, ages uh, and wants with physical activity. And what we're going to do now is, is look through some, some real world case studies just to put this um, into practice and, and showcase the different uh, pieces that we can do. So first of all, looking at the memo interactive zone. So to give you a bit of a headline for the memo, this is seven interactive posts um, that have 360 degree touchscreens on the top. Um, initially, this uh, was based uh, and designed for movement and memory. That's where the, the name memo comes from. Um, but we've seen this actually be used in an educational sense um, as you can see the case study on screen. So this is a, a case study local to our office in Nottingham, in Tolleton, where the parish council actually installed this play area and the memo in particular um, on site. But we sort of reached out to the parish school, got them down to the site and were able to do maths lessons um, whilst at the space. And I think it was, it was brilliant to see because um, when children are having fun, um, you know, enjoying themselves, they don't often notice that they're learning. So it was a great case study. And uh, you can see the brilliant quotation from uh, Mrs. Julie Cooper, uh, the year three teacher. And yeah, it's something that um, the memo can actually be used as an educational tool and even potentially incorporated into uh, our schools uh, to give that option because we know that not everyone learns the same. Not everyone is is very good at sitting in, in a classroom um, and, and learning. So. So how can we uh, offer different alternatives to ensure that everyone's catered for and that we're physically active at the same time? We've then got um, the SUTU interactive wall um, at uh, Lowfields Park in Sheffield. So the SUTU is a interactive ball wall that has 16 panels that light up in a combination um, of ways uh, to give different games. For example, uh, my favorite game is the speed SUTU. So you hit the ball as hard as you can uh, against the wall and it actually gives feedback in miles per hour or kilometers an hour um, on how hard you've hit it. Uh, but it also has games on accuracy, skill, and those sort of levels. And just going back to that sort of competence and confidence, um, this is a project which is located next to a football foundation uh, 4G pitch. So those who will probably be using the pitch are competent and confident enough to be joining in on sessions where it's a bit more of a formalized game. But the Su2, I think, sort of bridges that gap between not playing at all and uh, yeah, uh, actually playing in a formalized way where you can develop skills, um, grow and yeah, increase your, your sort of abilities within whether it be football, uh, hockey, tennis, cricket uh, and bridges that gap within. And this is one of the most played Sutus uh, in the country uh, just because of the way that it's situated and yeah, allows uh, the community to develop their skills as well. We've then got um, the Phono DJ booth, which is a fully interactive outdoor DJ booth that allows, um, it was in particular focused on the teenage age range, which is a very hard to, to cater for demographic, uh, where I think a lot of their identity comes from music and fashion. So we chose uh, Yelp chose to go down the music route uh, and give them a space where they can mix, cut, uh, and really perform any DJ uh, sort of function on a robust outdoor space. And um, this is a brilliant uh, example from Twente uh, University. You can see on screen. So this is actually where the DJ booth was used as pretty much a big speaker. And um, this is uh, what they call a Kanga uh, lesson, so like kangaroo yoga, uh, which is it, it's totally unique and, and different. And um, this is where I think the interactives are, are truly um, brilliant in the way that they sort of sit in an environment and are a piece of hardware. But I think it's the user group that truly defines how it's used and how they are interactive with. And for this one, uh, it was just a big speaker, but also had that multifunctional uh, way of being able to yeah, mix and cut and practice your DJ skills as well. Brilliant. And then looking at the sort of older generation uh, as well, and in particular the elderly, 
This is one of my favorite case studies from the Alp Interactives because I think it's it's very heartwarming. So um, in uh, Holland, they actually put in uh, 10 uh, Sona Interactive Dance Arches into 10 different care facilities. Now, what the, uh, the Sona Dance Arch uh, does, it's a, a big orange arch, very striking um, and eye-catching, uh, and it senses the movement um, of the users on the floor and has a range of games which are mainly focused around dancing, being physically active in that way. Um, but yeah, to, to cater for, it was actually originally for toddlers um, and yeah, that younger generation. But um, what we saw is it was actually a really intergenerational piece. And this is where uh, the case study from um, yeah, Holland came from. So uh, what we saw is um, when these sonar uh, dance arches were put into the care facilities, it actually meant that the the users and the sort of residents of the sort of care homes were more physically active. They wanted to go outside uh, and play. And the main reason behind this is because um, all of the interactives are connected to the internet, it actually allows you to create bespoke games for each piece. So rather than having the modern music that was already uploaded onto the Sony Dance Arch, they sort of turned back the clock, uh, put into the music from the 40s, 50s and 60s. And we see a lot with dementia uh, care home patients that, that music is a real key to unlocking memories and, and yeah, you know, sort of drawing on, on the health um, of uh, our sort of older generation who do have uh, dementia. And yeah, with that sort of catered for um, demographic with the different music that was set on the sonar actually led them to be more physically active, not only on their own, but when their, their kids, uh, their grandchildren came they all sort of played together as well, which which really showcased that intergenerational play. And I think really, yeah, proved that um, active communities element as well. So in principle, they were the, the individual pieces um, that we saw, but from a more holistic design uh, approach, this is a case that we've re which we've recently installed from Cantley Park um, in Workingham. So the the council really wanted a destination play area um, that would attract residents uh, to the park uh, and improved the play offer within the community so we took uh, the handle uh, and the mantle to actually design a space that was was truly different from a design principle we actually used no fencing within the play area at all so what this did was created rooms uh, of different play experiences throughout the whole space it then um, actually allowed for the challenge um, to be to the cater for uh, across the board. So without those barriers, there wasn't a, a physical barrier which you know stopped maybe a, an overdeveloped toddler to go into like a junior space. They were able to just run freely between the area and ensure that all generations could actually play together uh, and be active together and really have that community feel uh, within the area. And you know from the opening um, scenes, the photos that you can see here, um, it has gone down um, incredibly well. There's been such popularity from from all demographics where they want to really push themselves and challenge themselves to climb, you know, the higher the higher nets that you can see on the right hand side, or the yeah use the way uh, from Linie M on the left, and yeah, incorporated within that were uh, four of our interactives and. Going back to that, that real return on investment and the stats that we get through these, um, this is a sort of headline view uh, of uh, what we can see uh, from the three uh, interactives that are on site. You know, with a combined total of, of nearly 3,000 hours played between um, all three with highs of 11, 10, nine hours, this is the return on investment, the feedback um, which we get and, and quite an interesting statistic. So the interactives um, are sort of remote controlled so they can be switched off throughout certain periods of the day. So uh, for example, if you wanted it on from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night, you can set that and have it. But for um, the actual time which these interactives have been on, um, they've all been played over 30% of the time which they've been uh, active. And I think that stats and, and those sort of feedback is and has been described as gold dust by um, yeah, one of our clients from Broxbourne Borough Council. And it's brilliant to see that, that true feedback that we get. So I'm going to pass back over to Rosie for the final section, with, which is ensuring how we design for all. Thank you, Sam. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, we love the interactives. Um, we love playing on them. As Sam said, the, the Speed Suit 2 game is very addictive. We get very competitive on it. 
um and yeah never want to leave site um yeah so i'm going to cover the the last kind of design principle which is designing for all um which is something that i'm really passionate about um and could talk about for ages um we do do um a webinar different webinars so the webinar previous to this was about inclusion um if you're interested and we also have a webinar that is dedicated to designing more gender inclusive spaces so if you want to know more um then please check those webinars out otherwise i'm just going to kind of cover um this a little more um briefly um but if you want to know more um i'm happy to discuss in more detail so whenever we start talking about this topic i always bring this book up um which is where my journey of understanding began really um this is talking about women um and the data gap around women but i think this is also really really relevant to all minorities to all of these um underrepresented groups um there is this data gap this silence in the world where we just don't know um and that's a real issue and as designers um we can't provide solutions without knowing what's going to make a difference um and the only way we can do that really is through asking um which is why we really value consultation highly um but also um i think learning we all um need to take the time to learn more about different people's issues and the the things they face in their day-to-day -day life this is also a quote that's come out of um, research that we do um, around gender inclusion. But I think, again, it's really, really relevant. Um, we have the collective skills, expertise and ambition as a sector to ensure being active is accessible and attractive to everyone. So we need to be putting those with the greatest needs first. Um, for example, those living in areas of multiple um, multiple deprived areas with little to no access to free facilities. Um, these are the people we need to be putting as a priority. Um, and I think addressing these barriers would enable many marginalised groups access to be active. Um, and this quote just shows that improving access um, and the quality of active spaces for marginalised groups in the quotes case for girls it will benefit everybody. So I think that's a key takeaway. Um, so looking at girls in particular, research is really being gathered to fill those data gaps, which is amazing. And we're learning about the issues that teenage girls in particular are facing. Teenage girls see parks as being spaces for younger children and they don't feel like any space is theirs. Girls tend not to engage in casual sport like boys do in parks, um, I think mainly due to confidence and societal pressures. But if we provide spaces that girls can spend time in, that journey to the park can provide that physical activity that's missing from their lives um, at the minute. But I think that's that's the bare minimum, at least, is just providing a destination. We can work so much harder to provide real spaces that they can be active in that they feel confident and safe within um and another group um is um for disabled people with disabilities so every year there's a report on disability um that comes up with the same evidence really that people with special needs and disabilities are continually at a disadvantage in nearly every area of their lives these are these reports are a great way of highlighting the issue but we're still lacking that joined up thinking to push for more change. I think we're all aware that we consider the needs of our disabled communities, that we, we're not, um, oh, sorry, it's jumped ahead, <laughs> um, that we're not considering um, these needs. Um, and these are the very people who need these provisions more than anyone. Um, and it will have the biggest impact on because Shockingly, it costs three times more to raise a disabled child. So we need to be providing good quality, free facilities. And again, going back to that issue of the data gap, there's, there is very little research on physical activity of disabled children. So we just don't know. 
Um, but what we do know is that a third of disabled children take part in less than 30 minutes of sport and physical activity per day, and that they're the parents of disabled children find their child's level of physical activity very important, but they don't feel that they have the support to make that happen. Um, the government's recently brought in new guidelines for disabled children, but in my opinion, it's not ambitious enough. Um, it's not going far enough. And then another key area to look at is people who have different religions, races or ethnicity to the more general public. People of BAME backgrounds are more likely to live in urban areas with a deficiency of access to green spaces, which has been defined by the London plan in terms of how far households need to travel to access a space. But it's also the quality and the size of those spaces. So even if these groups, these marginalised groups have the desire to and intend to be physically active, they come across the very basic barrier of not having a safe space to do so. And finally, this is a group that um, Sam covered at the beginning of the presentation, but we need to highlight our ageing population again in relevance to Designing for All. Our population is ageing at a rapid rate. I, I can't believe that the number of people aged 65 and over increased by 23% between 2009 and 2019 at a time when the whole UK population only increased by 7%, and it's only going to increase more and more. So this is really a demographic that will need more space. Um, and I think with the issues that the NHS is um, facing, social prescribing is becoming much more popular. So better quality spaces are needed to provide to improve our population's health and well-being. So we know that um, visiting parks has been shown to facilitate a multitude of physical, psychological and social health benefits. I think what is really, really important is um, it mitigates the effects of social isolation as well, which I think this, this demographic really struggle with um, by providing a relaxed and enjoyable environment, which they can spend time with their family, um, but also meet new and existing friends. Um, and again, like with the girls, just providing that destination is providing that um, journey where people are being physically active just by traveling. And I think this is so nice. Um, the more time young and old people spend together, the more both parties benefit. So we see this trend of um, having toddlers in care homes, um, which is making a, a massive difference to both um, groups' lives. But why can't that happen outside? Why have we not thought about this, combining these two age groups in our public spaces outdoors? It just it makes sense. Um, so, yeah, that that just covers all the different kind of marginalised groups that we need to be thinking about um, in terms of, yeah, um, designing active spaces and prioritising these groups. So what we've been looking at, um, we've looked at who we need to consider when we're designing these active spaces. Now we want to give you um, kind of a sneak peek of something that we're working on that we think will provide a solution to get everybody active. So this is this is the provision for being active in these um, outdoor spaces, the mugger. Um, and we, we see a real issue with this. And this is something that is coming out of a lot of research that um, it's deterring pretty much everybody from being active. It's not the right solution. Um, so how can we improve the mugger? Um, we see a lot of, as I said, a lot of research around this space in terms of how girls feel um, and that the mugger is dominated by a very small group, um, which tends to be young boys. Um, and when they dominate that space, it then can't be used by anyone else. Um, so we talk about a mugger being multifunctional, but it completely becomes one like used for one reason um when someone starts using it so we're stuck with all these existing muggers i think um in our in our communities so what can we do to make them more appealing um i think we can break down those barriers so a real issue is the the fences um that make people feel unsafe so can we take those away 
and make it into more of an arena where people want to sit and spectate and it brings the community together. So that's a solution for our existing muggers. Um, but can we rethink what the mugger looks like? Um, we, we've started this as a project. So we've looked at how would you break up a space um, to make it more multifunctional, to give more options to a community? And what would that look like? Can we break out of the rectangular box as well um, to make it more inviting and welcoming? So, yeah, as I said, does it need to be a rectangle? Um, and how many more sports and activities can we put into a space? Um, and can we get more people being active together? So this is this is the kind of um, stage that we've come to. Um, so broken up space, which really facilitates a more multifunctional um, type of experience. Um, it's providing so much choice to the community. Um, and what we're thinking is that this can be a very collaborative um, design approach. So we want to work with communities. This can be adopted within consultation events and the community can design this space themselves. Um, so yeah, watch this space. This is something that we're working on um, in the background and we are excited to release shortly. So I'm going to pass back over to Sam, who's just going to summarise. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, really looking forward to getting the the mugger uh, out and about. I think it's from speaking to clients, uh, it's it's yeah something that is very different within the industry and and something that I think will will push and change the sort of landscape uh, of of our uh, of our sort of physical uh, activity and in particular our parks. So. Looking back at, at this presentation, um, I'm sure there have been a lot of uh, learning points from, from your perspective. So we just wanted to give a, a bit of a summary uh, of what we hope uh, you've learned today. So physical activity is getting better um, or is getting back to that sort of pre-COVID um, levels. And we want to push it forward um, in a more progressive direction where we can actually yeah, improve the lifestyles um, of our um, all our generations uh, through play. Um, we then need to address how we design these spaces fundamentally. So really to like taking that real holistic um, and collaborative approach to design. So looking at all of the, the facilities within that sort of snapshot within the space that we're looking to improve and develop on. And I think, although difficult, um, all it does, is it just takes some time. I think prioritizing this um, is really key and making sure that although it can be quite a reactive uh, industry in a way that you know pots of funding come up and we need to have a look at the space you know can you bring on board experts like ourselves to really look at the more master plan element of uh, your play um, and the sort of interconnection um, of each space so yeah um can we incorporate these key design principles when building a, a, an active space um yes of course we can yes so um is it a case of yeah, how do we actually yeah, incorporate these? I think once again, that collaboration um, is so key and bringing on um, different sort of experts um, in that way. And then finally, um, yeah, we need to consider um, all the key stakeholders uh, throughout this process. So the community and in order to create an, an active community, the community needs to be involved. Um, this is the one and these are the people that are going to be using these facilities going to be taking on um, this sort of mantle. So their input, and, and their ownership of the space is the true uh, and the key uh, defiance. So, yeah, that uh, finishes off our presentation for today. Uh, I've seen that um, we've had a couple of questions throughout, which Jos has been sort of monitoring and uh, had it sort of yeah looking after, which is brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Jos. So, yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to, to pop them in the chat. Um, I mean, Jos, out of interest, um, what what did you find the most interesting uh, about that presentation? Yeah. I mean, I found I found it all um, very interesting. We had some great uh, engagement over the chat about the interactives and um, asking about solar power um, and obviously being powered off the grid. I don't know if you kind of wanted to expand on that, Sam. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you certainly answered it um, in terms of that dual uh, ability of being able to use solar and uh, and grid. But what we can do is, uh, and we were actually talking about it in the meeting this morning with my, my colleague Caitlin. Um, so, if you are looking to get solar um, involved and, and brought into uh, your interactive, uh, we can if we send us the coordinates for the site, uh, we can actually do a bit of an assessment to understand throughout that sort of year period 
how many hours of playtime are you going to be able to get uh, throughout the space? Because what we'd never want to do is put in a piece that isn't going to get the, the correct amount of solar and then have it, yeah, um, unfunctional, um, yeah, uh, certain yeah winter periods. So if you want, um, I think it was, uh, was it Jessica or maybe Ingi. Um, yeah, um, if you want, Ingi, perfect. Yeah, if you want to reach out to us and, and have a, a site in mind, we'd be more than happy to do that um, assessment for you. We've got a we've got another question here from Chris um, about uh, designing sud specific play features, um, so to do with urban drainage. Um, I don't know if Rosie, if you wanted to take that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. Um, I know people are a little bit can be risk averse and a bit nervous about um, water and play and water with kids um but we've definitely done that in the in the past and we can send over case studies um there are a few examples so there's one project where we actually designed a wobbly bridge so wheelchair accessible wobbly bridge over um a, a suds basin um which was interesting and it connected two play areas from one side of the the suds to the other um which i thought was a really nice touch um, and yeah, I think all our, our Rabinia equipment um, is safe to go in water. Um, so there's, I think there's some examples on the, from the continent where um, balancing courses have been put across, across streams. So yeah, it's definitely possible. It's definitely something that we're open to, to working on with our clients. Um, I think the bigger question is kind of, are our local authorities happy to take on that risk factor um and just understanding i suppose everything that comes comes with that yeah i think a lot of it is evidential based as well you know if we can showcase examples that exactly as you said from holton where the wobbly bridge was yeah sort of put into that sud space um yeah we can definitely use that i think as well our colleague jen uh, who is one of our landscape um architects in-house has put together a, a small document with just design ideas uh, and features which we'd be more than happy to share with you, uh, Chris, if, if that would be of interest. I think it really adds to the kind of sensory element as well of a site. You know, that example um, is perfect because you're going through different planting, it's accessible for disabled people. It's a really nice kind of alternative route through the space. Um, I mean, I don't think we have any more questions coming in on the chat. Um, oh, no, sorry, we have one from Diane. Are there any key principles for making space for girls? Have studies identified what specifically um, do girls want to see apart from wide, open, safe spaces? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely worth watching our um, webinar on, on this topic. Um, that does go through um, a range of design principles. I think there's there's a huge community with so much knowledge and passion around this topic. So, um, yeah, we can put you in touch with with the right people. Um, and yeah, come and speak to myself because yeah, I'm happy to happy to discuss this in more detail in much more detail. Um, but I think, like we've said, it's it's all about asking asking them what they want. I think there's no um, size fits all solution to this. Every group of teenage girls is going to feel differently in every community so what one group of teenage girls in one area wants would be very different to another area so as much as we can say this is what they want I think it's really important that you ask the girls in that community what they want what they enjoy doing in their spaces that that's what this community will tell you um what we're finding is that swings are very very popular so I think teenage girls or girls generally feel that swings are very much kind of put into an age category. So swings are for little kids. Um, if they want to go on a swing, they get told off by parents because they're not supposed to be using them. So if they had a space where um, they could swing themselves, then they would much we would spend much more time there and feel welcome in that space so yeah there's there's lots of ideas um there's a there's definitely general consensuses around what they want but i think as i've said asking that community that specific community is key yeah it's where that community consultation really kind of holds its own in terms of yeah uh, you know making a bespoke space specific for each community 
definitely. Um, I mean, you mentioned it there. There's we have a whole webinar on this, um, and if if anyone's interested in finding out more, um, that webinar has been recorded and is available on our page. Um, we have two more webinars coming up as well. Um, we have Crafted, which is our um, a webinar on our bespoke process, and that's coming up in two weeks' time. And then followed by our key trends, which will be on the June on June the twenty eighth. And um, so, if they interest you, please do join us. Like I mentioned, all our webinars are recorded and available to kind of watch back through our catalogue. Um, and if you you know want to get in touch about the project or any of the topics that have been touched, please do contact us uh, via email on Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, yeah, as you can see, the um, our details are there on screen now. Um, but no, really thank you both, Rosie and Sam, for, for our webinar today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, and I hope you found it really interesting. Thanks, Yoss. Thanks for hosting. Thanks for everyone joining. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Yoss. Have a great afternoon. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.